Good morning, everyone. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series. Now, in just a minute, I'll be thrilled to roll out today's seminar with Ken Brown from Duke. This, I believe, is episode 111, 111 that have, holds a special place in my heart due to its incredible symmetry and my birthday, which is not today, but it's related to that number. So I'm glad you joined us on time. Before we begin, we'd like to give everyone just about a minute to tune into the live stream. And meanwhile, we'd like to know where you guys are tuning in from. Today, I'm joining from New York City. You can reply to that from in the comment chat box on YouTube, which is located somewhere above, below, left or right on your YouTube screen. And that's the same place where you can ask and discuss and have an interaction and, and ask questions and get answers from Ken and myself during the presentation. We like to keep this as interactive as possible and um, really have it more of a community. You can always go back and rewatch these episodes. They'll stay live on YouTube. And you'll know when the next one is coming up by hitting the subscribe button on the YouTube channel. But you can only discuss things live on Friday at noon Eastern time. And I see already that today we have people from New York, Mumbai, Durham, Portland, Yokohama, Canada, Michigan, Wisconsin, Madison. So thank you everybody for making all these different time zones uh, and joining us. So with that, I think it's time to roll out the latest 111th episode of IBM Kiskid Live Quantum, Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. I am your host, Zlatko Minna from IBM Quantum Research, and today I have the special pleasure of hosting Ken Brown from Duke. Hello, Ken. Hello, Zlatko. It's good to see you. Before we dive into your talk, Ken, allow me to, uh, you need no introduction, but allow me to introduce you nonetheless, as that is my job here. Uh, Ken Brown is the Michael Fitzpatrick Professor at Duke University. Uh, Ken is uh, a very distinguished scientist and researcher and currently is the director of the NSF Software Tailored Architectures for Quantum Co-Design, SDAQ project. Ken represents the DQI or Division of Quantum Information on the APS American Physics Society Council and is also on the editorial board of PRX Quantum and IEEE BITS and serves as a scientific advisor for IONQ. Ken and Ken's work has been recognized with many awards. Uh, he asked me not to name all of them because it's a very long list. So uh, with that, I bring to you Ken Brown. Great. Thanks, Leko, And thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in. I'm really happy to be here to talk to you about quantum error correction. I am in Durham. Uh, we actually are in the Chesterfield building downtown, far away from uh, the beautiful Duke campus you can see on this photo. And I so, understand the building is quite special. Yeah. Actually, the Chesterfield building is the first automated cigarette factory in the United States, I believe. And now it's been transformed into a space for um, Duke Quantum Research, uh, the Duke Proteomics Center, and then and also a lot of startup spaces for biotech companies and also um, German Technical Community Colleges here as well. Excellent. I'm excited. Place. Um, yeah. And then I'll also say, yeah, I'll take questions anytime. I don't even have to. I'm, I have no desire to get through all my slides, just happy to talk about uh, quantum error correction and science in general. So um, as we all know, in quantum computing, we really want more qubits with less error. And the current time is kind of this green triangle on the side. And if we think about things that maybe you want to do, like I would like to break Bitcoin, maybe you want to simulate molecules, I also like to simulate molecules, maybe you want to run physics models, and we have to ask, like, how much are these things going to cost to be competitive, not with your laptop, but with like real supercomputers? And so, just as an example, um, as a back from my background in chemistry, I've always been interested in can we use the quantum computers to solve hard chemistry problems? So, in this 2017 paper, um, researchers at Microsoft and ETH suggested that you would need about 10 to the 15 gates to um, look at this uh, catalytic center nitrogenase. And there's been many improvements across the world of, of making this cost less. So let's just imagine that it's going to cost about 10 to the 12 gates. And then we need kind of an operational error of you know, 10 to the minus 12. And I just want to say that I'm part of uh, the Institute for Robust Quantum Simulation, which is based out of the University of Maryland. Um, and, and we look at all levels of quantum simulation from what we can do right now to these very kind of like, what can we do in the future questions. So one thing you could imagine is, well, why don't we just use quantum control 
to make our qubits better. Um, I don't know where the limit of that will be, but it's hard for me to imagine that will get us out to 10 to the minus 12. We should, of course, try to make our problems easier. And that, again, is what many people have done. And I, I find it kind of interesting because sometimes we make the problems too easy, and then suddenly they become accessible to a classical computer again, which is great for the world, but uh, you know defeats our goal of finding these quantum problems that we can uh, really show an advantage on. So the idea of quantum error correction is we just scale up the hardware to many, many qubits. And then we use quantum error correction to take many kind of noisy quantum bits into a few very precise and accurate quantum bits. So how are we going to do this? So the first question is like, well, how do you scale up the hardware? And I do think in the community, there's kind of a split between kind of nature provided qubits, which we think of like atomic molecular and optical physics, and then human crafted, which come from more of a condensed matter point of view. Um, a nice scaling feature of uh, AM atomic kind of qubits is that every qubit is the same by nature. Um, they're weakly coupled to the environment, but there remain challenges in thinking about how to control and build up large numbers. So for example, if you're interested in some of the materials challenges of building ion trap quantum computers, um, you can look at this review article that I wrote with researchers at Lincoln Labs and uh, UC Berkeley. On the other side, when we think about human crafted qubits, what's nice is every qubit is the same up to manufacturing defects. Uh, typically, they're stronger coupling to the environment. And normally, people see these as more scalable because we're able to, say, print as many as you can fit on a chip. Um, but then you have to ask, like, well, why are we printing so few of them, say? Um, and I really like this example of um, quantum dart architecture, where you print basically um, three double weld quantum dots to form just a single qubit. And that, I think, is the most fascinating thing which is Hilbert space is really just a vast expanse. And so whenever you talk to people about like, oh, I picked my qubit or I picked this qubit, people have already made a huge down selection of all possible things you could do. And then, you know, they, they tweak with these different things. Um, yeah, so this, um, as an example, uh, one thing I really like to look at is this, this beautiful review paper from 2010 about different ways to, um, build quantum computers. And here we have three different ways to build quantum computers using superconducting qubits out of Joseph's injunctions and superconducting lines. And B, C, and D correspond to the kind of level structure you would expect for these energies. And there are many, many levels. And we just pick two to be our qubits. What I really like about this, this picture is that this paper is after the invention of the transmon. But the transmon has not yet been successful enough to make it into the summary figure. If you, you know, jump ahead a decade, uh, you see that actually, you know, the transmon and then extensions of the transmon are really well talked about in this um, review article from Will Oliver's group at MIT, where we move closer to something which is very harmonic and has like a slight bit of anharmonicity. Um, and from a broader perspective, right? There's no limit to how we can put together Joseph's injunctions and superconducting wires and resonators to make qubits. And so there's a huge unexplored area of Hilbert space of finding like what is a good, right, say, qubit. Same thing is actually true also in atomic physics. So as an example, um, looking at ion trap qubits, uh, typically um, ion trap qubits have primarily been ground qubits, so the, the information is stored in the ground state of the atomic ion. There have also been optical qubits, so a lot of the really great work in calcium ion quantum computing has used an optical qubit where one state is in the ground state of the ion and the other state is in a metastable state. Um, there has been a couple, just very few works looking at a metastable qubit where you actually just put the qubit up into this long-lived D state. Um, and recently in 2021, there's a nice paper where they, where researchers kind of argue that to get the most out of these ions, it could be useful to use all three qubits to basically push the quantum information, the two level system around this atom, which has a vast, which, which it by itself has a vast Hilbert space of places we could store this information. So 
once we've decided on our quantum bit, um, the next kind of region of Hilbert space we want to look at is taking collections of those bits to define a quantum code, right? So quantum code is, is you know, again, we just make a subselection of a massive Hilbert space. But what's nice about a code is it guarantees that for the errors that we expect will happen, it leads to detectable orthogonal subspaces. And then that allows us to have a correctable error that can be mapped back, right? So this is, this is kind of a, an interesting point because instead of thinking about the qubits in terms of just having the best single qubit, it probably becomes useful to think about a qubit which is best in terms of this next layer map um, where it not doesn't have to have the least error, it actually just has to have the most correctability. So um, I think what's been great in the last few years is there's been tons of quantum error correction experiments. These are just a few. I'll talk about a few more throughout the talk. I'm going to talk a lot about this, um, this experiment I was involved in with Chris Monroe's group, which is uh, an implementation of the Bacon Short Code, which is up top, um, using um, experiments that were you know, primarily funded by Arpa Logic, but also through this um, NSF stack project. There have been these long repetition codes from Google, this nice work from Honeywell at these color codes. And of course, um, there's also this interesting work in bosonic codes, um, which is which is yeah, actually a great and interesting direction right now, um, which I'm gonna ignore except for this one picture. <laughs> so um, just to try to get everyone up to speed, we wanna talk a little bit about stabilizer codes. So remember that a stabilizer code um, is defined by three numbers, number of qubits, the number of encoded logical qubits k and the distance d. Um, we typically look at these um, Calder Bank Steen Shore codes where the z checks and x checks are separate. Um, and then we look for the plus one subspace of all these poly operators. So it's these poly operators that splits Hilbert space into these different correctable subspaces. Um, so again, with the surface code, just as a reminder, um, what we see is we see syndromes being changed. And these uh, red circles represent, you know, syndromes which have flipped. And then we can decode them to find that, okay, there's an X error here, a Z error here, or a Y error here. And that's the encoding decoding procedure. And it relies again on the, the poly operators, um, the stabilizer operators putting the code into different spaces. And then the fact we expect the errors to be poly operators so that we can then fix them. Um, what I find interesting about this, uh, and we spent a lot of work thinking about, is if I think about classical error correction, the simplest example is kind of um, a repetition code. And that correlates very nicely to the easing model, in which I imagine I have a bunch of correlated spins. And then the errors in my stabilizer basically correspond to domain walls between spins that are pointing different directions. Um, the, now we actually want to fix two errors. And so one way that we've thought about it a lot is through, um, well, what's the spin model, which would have um, energy violations if it had X or Z errors. And that could be a compass model. And here's like a 2D um, square compass model with, with Z type using bonds and X type using bonds. And what we find is that um, that model can be mapped in limits to two important codes. The one is the Bacon short code. So the Bacon short code is interesting because it just has massive uh, checks. They have these two L, they have two L weight, two L checks. Um, whereas the surface code has many more checks, which are much smaller. So the plus side of the Bacon short code is there are actually not that many checks. Uh, the downside is there's no threshold with increasing L. And on the surface code side, of course, there's a threshold. And then, of course, we can also modify it through things like local Clifford deformation, such as the XZZX code, to really um, to map to the kind of errors we actually see. So we uh, spent some time thinking about um, what are the other codes that live inside the middle? So from the compass code, I take these gauges. These gauges don't form a code space because they don't come with each other. And then I take products of them to generate uh, CSS codes. And I can get both shore code, bacon shore, surface code, thinking of this. 
And um, with Myung Lee and Daniel Miller and Mike Newman and E.K. Wu, we were able to basically look at a very uh, broad range of these codes and actually kind of see where the threshold comes from. So we want to move beyond codes to actually implementing the process of uh, doing the error correction, finding the syndromes and getting that error. And so um, I call that procedure we want to implement, say, a fault tolerant procedure. And I don't think, I personally don't think fault tolerance is a, is a physical measurable thing. I think it's a design principle. Um, so our principle for designing processes where the correct answer is guaranteed if there are some number of faults or less, we'll say K faults. So here, we've designed the code, the circuit and decoder for a specific fault set, which are poly errors. This leads to a limit of operations, and it leads to like one of the main costs of um, error correction in terms of having like magic states and ways to get in gates that are not transversal. And that can all happen just through design, right? And then error correction is useful if the performance improves. And that means we have to be below some, some error threshold. So what's tricky about fault tolerance um, is that the errors interact with the circuit in a way where things like timing and, and dynamics matter. So here, what I'm doing is I'm, um, I'm measuring this syndrome here, this X syndrome here. And I have these four qubits, 0, 1, 3, and 4, which are the data qubits that touch this syndrome qubit, 11. Um, and then I can pick some order of C naughts to implement that circuit. And these C naughts all commute with each other. So if I just look at the circuit, it doesn't matter. Um, for example, if, you're, yeah, if you have a compiler which tries to compress things together, they can easily push them all over the place. But in terms of fault tolerance, the order really does matter because if a bit flip error happens on the syndrome qubit, it propagates forward through these C naughts into two X errors on the data qubit. Um, now, in the top situation, when I then check my syndromes in the next round, in the bottom situation, I get a very different pattern. And if I do a fix based on a single, uh, on the, the minimum weight error on that next pattern, here the minimum weight error is an X on the bottom. Here it could be either three, four, or zero, one, or equally good checks. And the result is at the top, the error goes away. And at the bottom, you've generated a logical error with this single X file. And so the value of this ordering for these small rotated service codes was first shown by Tamita and Swar um, in 2014. So what was useful for us in terms of rethinking this in terms of the compass code is that we basically think that these bonds of the underlying gauge give us information about how to build the circuit. So as long as we build these circuits so that we um, collect the gauge operators in order in the circuit, then it will be fault tolerant. And what's remarkable is that actually works for all of these codes that exist between Bacon Shore and the surface code. And it actually doesn't depend on the size of the, um, the, the checks. And so these weight, um, yeah, so these are the checks here. This is the corresponding decoder graph. This is kind of a graphical description of how the errors can spread. We're basically guaranteed that by following this gauge as our way to make the circuits, we maintain this sort of K-fault tolerance. Um, so we were able to first show that for the bacon short code, show that it works for all of these codes that come from compass codes, show that we could actually build, um, uh, yeah, we, we then tested it numerically um, with a fault tolerant decoder. And my student, Shilin Wang, um, developed this weighted union find decoder, which then we find is like a nice, uh, fast way to do decoding, which exists between sort of the union find and minimum weight perfect match. OK, so what's great is uh, a lot of the error correction we've been seeing lately are related to compass codes um, with Norbert's group. Uh, Norbert Linka's group, who's now here at Duke, um, we did this uh, kind of simulation of shore code, making larger shore codes, but just emulating a piece by a time. Um, these heavy hex codes work at IBM. 
uh, from our perspective are another example of a compass code. And then these 913 surface codes that have happened at ETH and, um, and USTC. And then also uh, these, these recent Google paper on, on larger codes all kind of follow from this model. Um, and of course, before these error correcting codes, people had done work on error detection code, again, all over the world, which is quite nice. Um, so now what I want to talk about is our nine qubit um, bacon short code using trapped ions. Uh, we have an ion chain quantum computer. Uh, basically, the ions are addressed individually by laser beams with a global beam on the other side um, to create the Raman transition. We'd use uh, the Sandia National Labs uh, surface electrode traps to hold the ions above. Um, this kind of trap is, is, is common. Um, yeah, it's more common nowadays, I guess. So, so here at Duke, uh, we have this uh, the IR for Eureka traps and then also an SF stack trap, which has a similar frame. Um, the DOE uh, QSCOW program in Sandia, of which I also uh, collaborate with them, uh, also has a similar trap, which is an open source, uh, you can apply to run um, projects on, on this on the QSCL project. So in the ion traps, um, all of our gates are done with these Raman lasers. Uh, we use ytterbium ions. We use the ground state qubit of this hyperfine state, which is first order and sensitive to magnetic field. Um, and then we use these two lasers to drive both the um, single qubit gate transitions and by detuning it so it pushes the motion to do a two qubit gate transition. So I'm not gonna go into the physics of the two qubit gates today, uh, but the key thing is for us, um, the <laughs> there's kind of effectively no memory error. Our real problem is always gate error. Now in our best gates uh, at Duke from um, joint work between myself and Jung San Kim, we were able to get, you know, 99.5, 99.3 kind of fidelity in small ion chains. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about with the vacant short code, there's a, the two qubit gate error is closer to 1%. Uh, single qubit gate errors uh, can be quite small. Uh, fundamental limits involve um, unwanted spontaneous scattering to these other states, which is leakage and also leads to bit flips. But our current limits are due to technical things like motion dephasing, laser intensity noise, ion heating. So now, the funny thing with this chain of ions is um, we can do a two qubit gate between any two ions in the chain. And so you could really, um, yeah, you can pick any code you want. So once we agree, okay, we're going to have a nine qubit code. And then I'm going to have a bunch of um, extra syndrome checks, which will count later. So let's just take three nine qubit. Um, uh, compass codes could be rotated surface code, could be bacon short code, could be short code. And which one should we pick? So one of our key results in terms of understanding that we can use a single qubit to measure these, um, the whole stabilizer, is a real reduction in the number of syndrome or ancilla qubits um, versus measuring the gauges. So um, yeah, so the original one of the original plans of the Bacon Shore is because you measure the gauges directly, you would just have a single um, syndrome qubit connected to these two data qubits uh, and then have kind of, again, a planar layout. But because we don't worry about the planar layout, we can go directly to measuring the syndrome, which greatly reduces these number of check qubits we need. Um, yeah, and so, and so in that work, we'll, the work I'll talk about, we do exactly that, so we end up using 13 total qubits, nine to be the data, and four to check the syndrome. Uh, we're also very interested in moving towards Steen error correction. So Steen error correction basically uses one logical qubit to check the errors of another. Um, and the beauty of Steen error correction is that it has kind of a minimal number of interactions between the syndrome qubits and the data qubits. So if, like us, your problem is gate error and not memory, it makes sense to reduce the number of two qubit gates. And so what we see is because I, for um, these kind of error correcting codes, I have to, to have it be fault tolerant, I have to do it multiple points in time. Um, in our scheme, you could end up having to do like 24 C knots per one type of error X or Z. Um, but in the Steam code, you just need the preparation of the other Steam qubit and then this 
um, this, this thing. And then I just want to um, point out my student, Shilin, had some really nice work looking at all of the different ways to do fault tolerant extraction between Shore and Steen. Um, and then he was able to use techniques that he developed in that paper to work with uh, these researchers at IBM, Thomas Yoko McConnor and Ted Yoder to show how you can use those similar techniques to do logical measurements on, um, on a wide range of codes. All right, so the next thing is, you know, I've been emphasizing that for us, uh, the problem is the gates. And more specifically for us, the error is primarily um, related to uh, over rotation, uh, which could be systematic. So there's like a real angle error, or it could be stochastic. So it ends up looking like a kind of poly error that's aligned along the axis of the gate. Um, and that diff I mean, that will differ between different ion traps. You know, so some ion traps, they may suffer more from like unwanted start shifts, which lead to kind of a dephasing um, T2 type of process. But in our, our experiments, we really see errors that primarily look like a slight error in the gate. Um, and as a result, we can actually use this to make simpler fault tolerant constructions. Um, but in this case, we're just gonna use this as our way to model which of these systems we should try to work on. So in this, these, these plots, um, we compared Bacon Shore versus surface code. And we, um, one challenge I think is that the, uh, that once you start to have a real error model, the idea of a threshold becomes really fuzzy because there's not a single parameter that controls error, right? There are actually multiple parameters that control error. So the whole thing is some complex space. And so then, um, because also we're not interested in memory, uh, we're not really, it's really hard to have a, a, a logical qubit live long, like to live longer than like the physical hyperfine qubit lives. Uh, we're interested in, okay, can we make like say a better gate, for example? So what would be the cost of doing um, encoded logical um, C0? And then we have like a basket of errors, which is the total physical error is somehow the two qubit error, these single qubit gates, any errors that may arise from crosstalk, any errors that may arise from memory. And then we compare um, here when the, when the logical error is smaller than the physical error. And that corresponds in these pictures to the dark colors versus the lighter colors. So when the logical error is, is better, we end up in this dark regime. And so these dark colored lines represent kind of a, a threshold of colored lines represent a threshold for those two codes. Now the blue versus orange actually represents when you should use bacon shore um, or you should use the surface code. And then in this particular thing, we look at basically two qubit gate error, some kind of memory error. This is a crosstalk error. And depending on the values, the right code changes, right? So that, I guess that's my, um, the key thing I want you to take home from today is that the right error correcting code really depends on your errors and the right procedure really depends on your errors. Um, and so the, in the, yeah, so in this case, we see for almost all regions, um, Bacon Shore is good unless we have a lot of crosstalk. So let me talk a tiny bit about that. Okay, so for us, that yeah. Ken, I was just going to yeah. say, perhaps that perfectly answers the question <clears throat> that we had from Hong Yao, which is, you know, is there a generally well accepted threshold for the error rate below which believe, we believe in fault tolerance? Um, but I think maybe you're 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 kind of hitting that on the nose here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you know, so we have this idea that um, you know, for the surface code, the fault tolerance threshold is around one percent, point seven percent. Um, but those models really depend on the fact that you have one parameter P, which controls everything. Measurement error, two qubit gate error, single qubit error, pro like <laughs> controls everything, right? Um, so in reality, those errors will be quite different. And, um, the, uh, and the damage they do is quite different. So for example, in the surface code, right, usually you can suffer a larger measurement error than you can suffer a two qubit gate error. Um, and so once you move to this basket of errors, there's really, yeah, it's hard to think about what that 
single threshold is. Great, thank you. And thank you for the questions, by the way. Feel free to post them in the chat, guys. Um, yeah, so in our in the ion trap systems, our, our basic gate is this kind of angled XX gate. Um, and then due to spillover of laser beams, um, we end up with unwanted, in this case, we imagine the phases are fixed, but we get an unwanted extra two qubit rotation, basically, between other, other, other gates. So um, in, the, sorry, in the plots that I showed you, um, those numbers are all based on an idea of actually using um, the chain reordering to get rid of crosstalk. And so what's kind of interesting is that for um, the Shore code, which I didn't show the full plot with Shore and Surface and Bacon Shore, you can see it in the, the paper. Um, for the Shore and the Surface code, we can actually find an ordering that is fault tolerant, meaning that we can accept, in this case, a single crosstalk error uh, without ru ruining our decoder. Um, whereas for Bacon Shore, we cannot find an ordering. We don't have enough space in some sense to like shift the qubits around to have no crosstalk errors. But it ends up still being better. <laughs> so even though it's not formally fault tolerant to the crosstalk errors, for that, for that specific task of the logical C0, for most of those regions, it is better. And of course, as crosstalk becomes worse, um, that's why the surface code, as we saw, uh, becomes more desirable in this, in this specific case. Now, of course, there are other ways to try to get rid of uh, crosstalk. And um, for example, there's some nice work from Marcus Miller's group, uh, which basically says we can spin echo away by applying, um, yeah, basically spin echo Y turtle pulses to the qubits that we don't want to have talk to our main qubits, um, and then and then and then if it's if the error is coherent, it it vanishes. So recently, in a nice experiment again with Jung Sang Kim's group, uh, we we shifted to sort of an interesting scheme, which is shown here, where we kind of do um, I don't know what the best thing to call it is not spin echo. Uh, we apply these two Y gates, which don't do anything to this um, XX kind of two qubit interaction. But what it does do is it cancels out any unwanted crosstalk. It does the spin echo on the crosstalk side. And by applying it to the qubits that are engaged in the gate and not the qubits that are neighbors, we can actually suppress all of the neighbors. And so um, in these plots below, what we find is this um, local suppression, which is the green bar here, does better than these neighboring suppression and of course, if we don't do any crosstalk suppression, the amount of error that happens on the neighboring qubits, basically through the, the neighboring qubit being excited, can grow in, un, in this kind of envelope way because it is an overall coherent error. So um, key thing, again, is we're able to have very good uh, two qubit gates. Um, and the second thing is that that axis where crosstalk is increasing isn't really our problem. And if it was our problem, we should be able to, to remove it through this sort of uh, coherent control. method. So just to make sure I understand, so on like this uh, local suppression plot, on the second wire, you have a Y gate because it was, did you say, because I have a type of ZZ interaction with the spectator right below on the third wire, that's going to flip and cancel that one? Was that? That's right. That's right. OK. And, and, and the key thing is the. Um, the other kind of subtle thing is that the, the real interaction on the spectator qubit here, or on, yeah, it doesn't want to interact, right, is a sigma phi in the xy plane. So then the z will work fine, because we know it's sigma phi. But here, because we know really well that the, the, the qubits we're interacting with, we've chosen that phase to be x, then this y works really nicely. Mm -hmm. And you don't need any extra Zs on the third qubit? No, no. Because they, because they, yeah, because the, the, the angles cancel away at, the, at that qubit. And so in this, in this limit of three qubits, uh, it, you know, it looks, it looks maybe cheaper to do this. But when we look at the actual system, there can be crosstalk onto uh, one, two, three other qubits. And by shifting to this region, we actually only have, um, right, we only ever have to talk to the qubits we're talking to. 
And on the spectator qubit here, is the T2 star an issue or is that totally negligible? It's totally negligible. Mm -hmm. Very, it's a bit yeah. different from super connecting qubits in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, um, yeah, I will say generically when I'm talking with <laughs> super connecting qubit uh, people, I think that's like the biggest, the biggest difference, which is our memory is basically good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so, so the, you know, superconducting qubits in your ideal case, you get to the point where your gates are just like say T1 limited. Um, but that T1 is basically the same, whether you're applying a gate or not applying a gate. Mm -hmm. But for us, when we're not applying a gate, the qubits are really just good, <laughs> basically. It takes me, yeah, it takes many, many gates for the error to accumulate, um, for their, for a memory error to be equivalently bad. And quick question from the audience here from Ro Kumar. Um, are these techniques for quantum error correction and the kinds of things you're showing now going to work for ion trap quantum computers only, or can we adapt them to say superconducting devices as well? Cool. Yeah, so this one, um, this, this idea of kind of uh, local suppression should work fine for superconducting qubits. Um, so imagine you were doing, um, like imagine you're doing like a cross resonance type of gate in a superconducting qubit and you have like an unwanted additional coupling to however many other qubits due to some, um, I don't know, some chip mode you weren't thinking about, then this kind of coupling, yeah, should, yeah, should in principle work because it just relies on the fact that I find something that commutes with the two qubits that I want to have something happen on. And then we'll anti-commute if 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 there's this um, yeah some neighboring piece, but then it does get into this question about the um, coherence part, right? So that's only true if that dominant error remains coherent. So as Lako mentioned, like if the dephasing is too fast, then it won't help you. Like you really need it to be you, you need the dephasing to be slow relative to that time scale. Awesome. Yeah, we work very hard with. Dynamic with the coupling here sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Yeah, so so I just want to keep pushing. So on this 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 coherent errors piece. Um, so we we have kind of a simple model we use um, to move between stochastic poly errors and coherent errors. And then I just want to say for for people thinking about it the. The difference between these two things is really a question about time scale. So if the noise in your system is slow relative to your gates, it seems like a systematic rotation. And if it's super fast relative to your gates, like you can write down the same physics, but that super fast part basically averages it out because you can't, you don't have any access to where your gate stops relative to this like fast dynamics. So we have this model where we basically um, extrapolate between a system which is purely an extra rotation and a system where it's, it becomes just this stochastic I and G. And then our, our like conceptual models, we just think about it as a gate. So if we do the gate perfectly, we just get the gate. We have a little bit of epsilon. It's like we do a tiny over a gate. And so my student, um, Drypto, yeah, and Muyan and Mike, uh, basically had this idea of, well, if somebody gave me um, a controlled left and right part of a stabilizer, if I put them together, it would actually cancel this kind of coherent error. Um, and then normally that's not so useful because your stabilizer, um, you know, your stabilizer will be like weight four. So these two things are like weight three interactions and you probably don't have that kind of, you don't have like a three qubit, native three qubit interaction in your system most of the time. Um, but what's funny is for Bacon Shore, um, this corresponds because of this connection to gauges back to the gauges. So now I'm going to measure this weight six stabilizer. I'm going to pick this really weird order because I want to make it follow the gauges. And then I use this idea of stabilizer slicing to make the entangling XX interaction be positive or negative. And if I set them in the right way, it will actually cancel out um, the coherent gate error. Um, and kind of remarkably, uh, if on the left side is purely stochastic error after gates and the right side is purely coherent error, um, 
we find that the bake and sure code, like so in, in this particular set of errors we have, and just this is just a preparing, doing an error correction and measurement circuit. As you saw, for most of the region, the bake and sure code does better than the, than the small surface code. Uh, kind of surprisingly, um, surface code became more or less on, in this model, like independent of how stochastic or not it was. But the bake and sure code really gained as the errors became more coherent, um, which is which is nice. And it's like an example of how um, if you have coherent errors and you know about them, you can do a lot of good work. If you don't know about them, then, then they are bad. So now we talked with our uh, good collaborator, Chris Monroe, uh, about trying to run some of these bake and sure experiments. Um, this is the this, this, this setup, which was at the University of Maryland when these experiments were done, but now is here also at Duke. Uh, again, here are the, here's Chris and his team who worked on it. Uh, Marco and Crystal were research scientists and postdocs respectively at the time, and now they're both also faculty here at Duke. Um, and yeah. So the idea is we have these 15 ions. We just take 13 of them to be our computer. Um, advantage of bacon shore is that you can prepare the logical state unitarily without having to do measurements we then check these stabilizers and we look at doing logical operations so um, in this experiment we're able to do everything except for the conditional error correction where you would do multiple rounds of error correction so we can encode we can do logical gates we can measure syndromes we can do error detection and this 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 last part of the conditional error correction was missing so the first thing we examined was um, the difference between, say, not fault tolerant linear prep and fault tolerant prep. So in fault tolerant prep, we again we actually just generate these three GHC states because of the concatenated nature of the shore code. Basically, um, each of these blocks will fail independently, and we can have one block fail and fix it and still have good logical information. If we want to make an arbitrary state, we need to make that state. And then we need to make these two control knots to then propagate that information to these three pieces. Um, you can tell this is not fault tolerant because obviously if the state is bad, you're in trouble. Um, and the second thing is if you have these, uh, each, if either of these control knots go bad, you're also in trouble. So what we saw is if we just took the non-fault tolerant preparation to make plus minus zero and one versus the fault tolerant preparation, um, if we just look at the expected outcome of Z or X minus what we measured, we actually see it's not so bad. Um, they, they line up the way you would expect. Um, but the cool thing is to then move to correction. So then when we look at the measured data qubits, we get syndrome information in that information, and we're able to then do a correction, and we see that the, as expected, the fault tolerant procedure leads to a much lower spam. And if we go all the way to detection, where we reject any, um, yeah, we reject any states that that fall outside of the code space, uh, we actually saw no, uh, <laughs> there were no residual errors in the, the fault tolerant way. Um, we want to prepare other states, of course. So, for example, if you want to do magic state distillation, um, you need to make states that are not um, Z or X. Um, and so we compare doing, you know, rotations between the Z and X states in a fault tolerant transversal way versus directly preparing some state on that axis versus applying a very complicated, um, uh, yeah, you know, multi-qubit uh, unitary, which does the transformation on the logical space. Um, I do want to say that it's a little bit, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't have time to really talk about the subtleties of gauges and um, being in different, uh, yeah, being different, it being in different gauges. So there are these, these extra degrees of freedom that we don't control in Bacon Shore. And so the transversal gate involves applying all these transversal single qubit gates, but then you actually switch gauge. And then both this preparation gate and this logical operation all happen in the same, um, the same X gauge. And then what's nice is that actually all of them work pretty well. Uh, if we just look at the points, so the fault tolerant one can only be at zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, two pi. Um, and then if we fit them to kind of a, a basically an oscillating cosine with some decay, 
uh, we see the decay is quite low, the amplitude is quite high, particularly after we do correction and then detection. And then I think this one um, with the continuous is quite nice because you can see the correction helps quite a bit. The detection actually hurts you a little bit um, in that in some sense, weight two errors are a little more likely because of this large unitary block. Uh, the direct preparation is the most important part, and it looks like, um, based on our, our measurements, that we can prepare the states you would need to do magic state distillation uh, with an error of about 2%. Um, yeah, so this is an example of how we calculate that. So we just look at these different points. We, the one challenge of fault tolerance is we, you can't measure any direction, right? You can only measure directions. Um, yeah, you, you have to measure directions in a fault tolerant way. And for, uh, yeah, for Bacon short answer, this code, all these codes, really you can only measure X and Z and measuring Y is quite challenging. And so from X and Z, we can get a, a bound on kind of what we expect the fidelity to. So then we're able to do stabilizer checks. Um, so this is what happens if we don't do anything. We see, you know, kind of 20% of the time. Ideally, if there were no errors, these would all just be zero here. Um, for all four checks. Uh, there are errors in our system because it's a real system. And so we see 20% of the time something might click inappropriately. But when we add in different errors, um, we get the right pattern. And then I think this is like one um, sort of big difference between kind of quantum simulation type experiments and error correction. So in quantum simulation, you can use all kinds of, say, error mitigation techniques to extrapolate to what the right answer should be or like push you to that answer. And so here, that would be equivalent to basically anything which is below half, you basically suppress to zero and everything which is above, you, ex you express to one. Um, and then you would see that this looks perfect. But in error correction, it's a little bit tougher because we have to, um, yeah, we, we're kind of forbidden from doing that. We have to accept just accept the bit that we get. And I think that's one reason why, um, yeah, but one, I find it, one reason why I find it hard sometimes to convince people to do error correction experiments because you have to, you just have to accept the bits you have. Um, now, at the beginning, I talked a lot about our, one of our main results is this new fault tolerant gadget for these compass codes. Um, and we have, you know, this idea that you should follow the gauges and then we imagine there's gonna be a Z error here versus kind of a naive way of doing it where you run around like this. And from a design principle, I'd call this one fault tolerant and this one not fault tolerant. Um, the referee, one of the referees asked us like, well, you haven't proven that it's fault tolerant. Uh, so I, of course, were back like, it's just a design principle. <laughs> we just do this design. Uh, and I asked um, Laird, who is the lead experimental author to just run an experiment where we inject this coherent theta error. And the results to me were kind of, were very interesting. So the, the key result from my perspective is at no extra error, there's basically no difference. <laughs> and, and why is there no difference? There's no difference because this Z error, which corresponds to like an unwanted dephasing error or a stark shift, we just don't have. <laughs> So we've made this fault tolerant circuit to something we don't have to worry about. Now, if we make this error happen, then we get the what you expect, which is if you don't do correction, the probability of the parity check giving you the wrong answer or flipping from plus to minus follows the same pattern because these circuits are equivalent basically. But when you do correction because of the fault tolerance, the fault tolerant method remains um, gives you the correct, uh, right, correct result, even if this goes all the way to Z, because it, it can protect us against that. Uh, whereas the not fault tolerant one, this ends up becoming a logical Z error, and it, it collapses and you get, or sorry, it becomes a logical X error, and you get the opposite um, measurement when you measure the expected value of Z. So it's pretty cool, because I think it, it shows, yeah, fault tolerant design works, but if that's not your error, maybe it doesn't matter. So there, there can be some shortcuts because of that. What's the dominant error to consider here? Our dominant error is still the two cubic gate error, mm -hmm. right? And that two cubic gate error, because it, um, yeah, basically because it's an XX type error. 
And then that XX type error um, commutes with all the other two qubit XX gates. It doesn't lead to any kind of hook errors. It will, it, yeah, it can basically, you know, change your, your, your measurement outcome. So there'll be some loss in the measurement outcome, but it doesn't propagate in a terrible way. Okay. Okay, good. Um, so then the next thing is, okay, we do have a little bit of T2 error, uh, which lasts, you know, usually, usually like our, um, getting to like half a second is no big deal. Uh, the world limit for, for a turbium T2 error, I think is um, like an hour now. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we usually go to like a, a couple seconds and call it good. Um, so then when you look at the, the, the states and not at the stabilizers, you see that we've created three maximally sensitive to magnetic field states, <laughs> uh, which are basically little ferromagnets. And so our logical um, lifetime of just like preparing and waiting, we get a much faster T2, which with correction, of course, gets better, but it's still, it's still fast. When you write it as states and not as stabilizers, um, you realize that moving to this anti-ferromagnetic type of state greatly improves um, the decay time. And then we actually get a, a logical coherence over these nine qubits, which is a similar time scale to our physical coherence. Um, and then from an error correction standpoint, what we've done is we've basically shifted our stabilizers from Z type to negative Z. Now what's really, what I wanna emphasize here is that if you only have stochastic poly errors, which is the way normally people talk about error correction theory, then this change will not do anything. It's only because the error is actually coherent that it leads to this, um, leads to this game. And so, so we worked on that and there's also some nice work from my colleague, Robert Calderbank, where they basically showed um, if you're guaranteed kind of global magnetic field noise, you can always build these weight to kind of checks to totally remove it. Uh, following, following um, it's related to ideas from old ideas in decoherence free subspaces, uh, but it comes from a, a coding theory perspective, uh, which is a little bit different. Uh, so following up on that, like one of my favorite papers recently uh, was this nice paper, um, from Princeton and Yale on looking at neutral atoms and thinking about how actually there's a way where we can turn the errors not into erasure errors, not into, not into poly errors, but into an erasure error, which moves your qubit, which sounds bad, but you actually know where it happened. And as you can see here, by shifting to this erasure type error, these plots of kind of thresholds um, of a surface code using neutral atoms, uh, the threshold actually increases. And that goes back to that question about, is there a threshold? The answer is no, because it really depends on the details of the error model. Um, and so by switching to an erasure error model, they get a much higher threshold. And I think, I just wanna point out there are other ideas that are very closely related. Like I mentioned already, these XZX codes, more generally making Clifford transformations to try to map your errors onto a bias that you control. That works really nicely with some of these ideas of bias preserving cat codes, which allow you to do gates that maintain the bias. Um, it also connects to ideas on designer cluster states so where you build clusters of different types. So there's a, there's a huge amount of interesting work here. Um, I just wanna say with respect to the erasure, uh, we, we joked that we tried to, to, to do at least the third movie in the erasure conversion trilogy, which is the that is so compelling. Um, it was not surprising to see ideas on, again, you can put together doses and junctions and capacitors and supernuclearize any way you want. Here's a way where you basically transform any T1 error into an erasure error from your qubit state to something which is hopefully detectable. And then with my student Ming Yu and then Wes Campbell, uh, who's a professor at UCLA, uh, we were able to show how to do erasure type of conversion using these metastable states, um, metastable qubits, and not just the ground state qubits and trapped ions. So yeah, so it's an amazing thing because basically just by changing our protocol and how we where we define our qubit space, 
we can actually transform the type of error. And it turns out that erasure errors are actually very good and forgiving. Um, like if you could pick an error, it'd be, it's, it's, it's a great kind of error to have. So then, um, yeah, to summarize a little bit, so quantum error correction beyond poly errors is something my group's worked on for a long time. These are some, some of our works on thinking about coherent errors. Uh, we showed with uh, Joel Wallman um, and Barry LaFlamme and coworkers, uh, yeah, Stephanie Bill's the first author there, uh, that basically for larger codes, it shouldn't matter. Um, better than that, if you do stabilized sizing, you can fix it. And then we can actually minimize the code space based on the coherent errors we have. A real problem is that Hilbert space is large. And if you fall out of the qubit space and you don't know it, that's called leakage. And so then um, I worked with my student, Natalie Brown, and then Mike Newman, where we tried to um, building off ideas from, uh, yeah, from IBM and Google on how to handle leakage and superconductors to just apply them more generally to these codes. Um, and then, as I just mentioned, if you have a leakage, which you can tell, then it becomes an erasure error, and that is the best. And, 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 then, and then once you think about that, you can think, well, actually, Maybe I don't want to design systems that have lowest error. I want to design a system which has the best error for future error correction. So I'm super excited about quantum error correction right now. I think there's a huge amount of um, advances on the hardware side. Um, there's also this, this advance in like actually thinking about the real physical errors and how that connects to your decoder. Um, I deleted all my slides about <laughs> finite rate codes, which I think has also just been um, in the last three years, just like an explosion of ways to try to, to make error correction more compact. Um, and I, I think this is sort of forcing the theory of fault tolerance to transform, and uh, there's a lot of great work to do. So I want to briefly, uh, you know, think, of course, uh, funding from the National Science Foundation, the Army, IARPA, and the Department of Energy. Um, yeah, I didn't really talk about it, but Mingyu and Wes were my collaborators on this erasure paper. This is a picture from QIP 2020. Um, with uh, yeah, so like Natalie and Rian and Dripto and Mike, I talked about their work with respect to um, uh, Bacon Shore and, and a little bit about leakage, and now they've all gone on. Um, I'm actually really excited. Like you know, Rian's an author on the the the, inter the heavy hex code IBM paper, Dripto and Mike on this distance five paper, and Natalie on this continuum paper with um, doing a logical C not between steam codes. Uh, I I don't know. It makes me like a like a very proud advisor, I guess. Uh, Narayanan worked with uh, Robert Calderbank on this getting rid of all coherent errors. I mentioned he's now a professor at the University of Arizona. Uh, if you're looking for PhD advisors, you should think about him. And you can also think about me, but also think about him. Catherine's now a grad student at MIT. Uh, Shilin will defend his thesis next week, and then we'll go off to be a postdoc at Yale. And then I just also want to say that um, uh, the, the group has grown quite a bit. Um, in terms of the quantum that's going on at Duke, we now have this Duke Quantum Center, of which Chris Monroe is the director. Uh, we have all these nice faculty. We're looking for postdocs in all types of, of work, from theory to experiment to engineering. Um, and with that, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ken, for the really nice work, and congratulations on the great results. Um, there were a few questions that I uh, waited on until the end. So folks, feel free to post those and repost questions and add questions as we get to the end here. Very nice picture with uh, color coordinated shirts. Maybe we'll start with a question from the middle of your talk from Juan Wei. How were the two qubit uh, Momur Sorensen gates benchmark? Was it with randomized benchmarking uh, or decay or parity oscillations? So if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, so we normally, um, we do kind of two things. So the the number we usually report is a parity oscillation report. So that checks the parity, parity oscillation checks that the entanglement fidelity is, is maximal. And the thing which it misses is it misses, um, <laughs> it's a weird thing to talk about, but you have like X, Y, and Z of your single qubit gate, and you have X, Y, and Z of your two qubit gate. And if you're lucky, those things agree. And this parity oscillation misses that, right? So we do a different type of check, which allows us to see that these things are aligned with each other. Um, like one easy way to do it is you basically feed it 
what you think should be as eigenstates and show that nothing happens. Um, yeah, we do not usually do two qubit randomized benchmarking because um, I mean, we have done two qubit randomized benchmarking. The numbers I reported were from parity, excellent things. Two qubit randomized benchmarking takes a long time and it, um, yeah, I just haven't, I, I would say, okay, so sorry. Now I'm gonna, my big picture problem is this. I think characterization tools should help you fix your gates. Um, and oftentimes when you have a very complicated characterization tool, which ends up taking pile of data over, over long periods of time, which also kind of mixes systematic data, the, that result you get doesn't tell you how to fix it, say. Um, Great, thank you. I, uh... Yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, I think our audience has a lot of diverse backgrounds. Some of them are definitely hardcore RB people, and some are, you know, much more about let's find out actually what each poly term in the error is. And we've had a number of talks here on uh, by myself and others on you know really learning the noise in the quantum device at scale, including the crosstalk, and really understanding as many of the possible generators or the actual terms in the noise as possible. So I, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say this is my favorite. I don't. Um, I yeah. I don't have this. Have the slide in my talk, but one of my favorite examples is we were using um, gate set tomography from Sandia National Labs using their version of it, um, and. What's funny is we use this kind of composite pulse technique to take three single qubit gates to make one really good single qubit gate called SK1. And we know it works. And so we, we've we always compared like, um, so if you do randomized benchmarking with single qubit gates versus these composite pulse gates, the composite pulse gate randomized benchmarking is always better. You do gate set tomography, it's better. And then we asked, well, can we close the loop and take our gate set tomography results for single qubit gates and predict if the composite pulse will help us. And its prediction is no. <laughs> its prediction is that the, 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 yeah, its, its prediction is no, it will actually hurt you. And the reason is because gate set tomography assumes errors are always constant, but composite pulse actually is great if you have like a slowly varying error. So when you take all that gate set data, like it just scrambles to an average. But mm -hmm. if you, if you, <laughs> yeah, if you, um, I don't know, you, you, I guess you have this analytical hypothesis that it should work and then you can see it does, but it's, it's, I, yeah, I'm always, um, well, I mean, as, as you know, it's like, I'm very interested in this problem of like, how do we characterize in a way which makes things better? <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And I'm excited to see, I think there's more and more work in, in coming out in the community that helps with that. But that's not the topic of today. Question from Daniele Cuomo. Thank you, Ken, and congratulations for your work. I would like uh, some considerations on global gates. Would global gates leads, uh, lead to less faulty measurements? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> so in, um, in um, trapped ion quantum computing, um, you can ge basically generate um, an, an easing type interaction between any pair. Um, just as for other people who maybe don't know about global MS gates, uh, you can actually make an easing interaction between all the qubits at once. So what's interesting is from a theory of fault tolerance method, this global interaction all at once, if I assume polytype errors, could be really bad. It basically would um, allow errors to propagate to all these pieces. But that piece of data I showed you where our careful selection of C0 order didn't matter says that in that experiment, we could do the full global gate and it would be, it would, um, it would probably be better because it would um, happen in less, less overall time. And therefore, um, you know, some other side effects of heating, et cetera, should be better. But it's in it, yeah, it's, that's a great question actually. And it really depends on the errors that actually happen. Excellent, thank you. Um, quick question from Boris Barbanov. On considering coherent errors, how well do you think randomized compilation 
on the quantum error correction circuit itself would work for the surface code. So effectively twirling. Yeah, so for the distance, um, for the for the distance, the small code we looked at, distance three, it seemed like it kind of the the poly error, the poly measurements kind of do the randomized compiling for you a little bit. I do think randomized compiling often helps, um, like is, is a great is a great uh, what I want to say, it's a, kind of a hedge. So like if you don't know where what your coherent errors are, randomized compiling is great because it just you know, averages them to some point. Um, again, in work, if, if we look at the Bacon Shore code example where the coherent errors, having errors be more coherent helps you. If we randomize compile, if we randomize compile the circuit, we would lose that game. So the, so if you have a lot of knowledge about, it, it, you don't need to know the, the, um, the strength or magnitude of the coherent error, but if you have a lot of knowledge about its expected form, then often you can do better than randomized compile. And then, and then I want to say that actually um, some nice work from my student Shwarnadeep Majumdar, who's about to go work at IBM. Uh, basically, we can put them together, so we can take the part where we understand um, how the errors connect. Um, and, and do our, our, our special trick. And then we can take that block and do randomized compiling outside of it for the coherent errors we, we haven't expected. That's excellent. And, uh, I, can, I can echo for how great Swarn and Deep is. Um, now, a follow-up question, perhaps, um, uh, for, uh, well, uh, on the simulation side. For theory research, what packages does your group use for simulation of large systems of qubits? How large a system can you actually study computationally before it gets too resource intensive? Yeah, so that's a great question. So you know, for some of our largest um, systems, we use uh, we use things like you know STEM or pi matching or whatever. But when you use those systems, you have really kind of like limited um, uh, limit limited types of error models, right? So then, if I want to look at coherent <laughs> error models. Um, then we, um, yeah, we, we use, you know, QSIM kind of packages where we just, we just model the whole density matrix. And then for us, you know, once you get beyond, um, you know, 10, 15 qubits, that starts to get really pricey. Um, and so there was some really nice work by, um, um, Thomas O'Brien, where he basically thought about how, because you're always measuring these syndrome qubits. You don't really need them to be active all the time. Um, and so you can actually work with this smaller Hilbert space, but then you have to be careful about how you, um, basically how you account for time. Uh, but, but yeah, that's, that's a real challenge, I think. So for really large systems, we're kind of forced to have simple error models. Otherwise, we, we're, we're stuck if we can't do the work. <laughs> It's a, it's a, it, it's a common trend. Um, and final question from Akash. Interestingly, your group works both in theory and experimental side of QEC. Would love to hear what life is like working on both sides in the same groups. <laughs> so I think that's more of a career question. And uh, uh, yeah. Uh... I, okay, so I mean, yeah. So my my big, <laughs> I was just recruiting grad students uh, yesterday. I do think like that is one very special thing about our work here is that if you have a theory, if you're a theorist and you want to run the thing on an experiment, you just walk <laughs> over to the other side of the lab and like convince them to give it a try. Um, I think I would say you know, the way that I got to this position was. Um, uh, as a PhD student, I just did theory. And when I was finishing my PhD, I felt um, I felt like my theory was really disconnected from, uh, yeah, just, just disconnected from what was actually going on. And so I then did an experimental uh, postdoc with Ike Chuang. Um, and then that kind of informed me of, um, yeah, yeah, really informed me about like where this connection was. So I would say, 
uh, if you want to head this way, I think you know being a theorist who works closely with some experimental group really does open up new questions to ask. Because when you when you don't talk to experimentalists, um, you just kind of imagine like okay, these are, these are, I imagine these layers will happen, but maybe they don't happen. Um, but for the theorists in the audience, <laughs> I do want to say that as a theorist, it is important to sometimes not worry about experimentalists, to really think like like what would be good. To have what would be nice to happen and then basically pull the experimentalist towards that so at the very beginning of the talk i showed this picture from hrl of these quantum dots um what's amazing to me is that basically the the basic idea they were trying to do um was a theory paper from almost 20 years ago but they 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 realized that idea was like someone at HRL is like, that idea is so amazing, we should make it happen. And maybe it takes a long time, but like it's, it's worth as a theorist to try to push that other boundary too. Well, Ken, with that, if you'd like to add any final words about recruiting graduate students or the like, this would be a great time. Yeah, so anyway, do, as I mentioned, do quantum centers, uh, we have many <laughs> people now. Um, we, you know, this year's cycle is kind of completed, but think about it for next year. Um, and yeah, thanks a lot for coming to the talk. And uh, Slacko, I hope to see you in person sometime soon. And yes. thanks. Thank you, Ken. Um, I will convey, since you can't see the chat from, from all of our audience, from Daniele, Boris, Rule, and everyone else uh, saying thank you, great talk. Uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So with that, folks, thank you very much for tuning in, for the many great questions, keeping it interactive and fun as always. It was been our pleasure, Ken, to have you here, and congratulations uh, to you and the team on the very nice results. And with that, folks, we will see you next Friday at noon Eastern time.